Hello, everyone. My name yeah, is Stephen. We're going to get started in just a second. And, and, and um, you start. Marsh is going to do the intros, Steve. Oh, OK. All right, we're live right now, but I'm going to give everybody a second to join in, OK? We'll get started in just a moment. Hello and welcome. I'm Marsha Mott and I'm the coordinator of the University of Florida Health Wellness University. We have a great presentation today and we're sorry for the delay, but our topic is one that affects nearly 6 million Americans, Alzheimer's disease. If you have questions for our speakers during the webinar, use the Q&A chat feature at the bottom of your screen, type your question, it'll come to me and we'll answer as many questions as we're able to at the end of the presentation. We can't address specific medical concerns, but we can discuss broadly what's going on with Alzheimer's and Alzheimer's research. Our first speaker today is Dr. Stephen Dukoski. He is a prominent Alzheimer's disease and traumatic brain injury research and UF's alumni. He serves as the deputy director at the MBI, or McKnight Brain Institute. His research focuses on understanding the neurochemistry, neuroimaging, treatment and prevention of Alzheimer's disease. He's also co-authored the first report of dementia associated with traumatic brain injuries among professional football players. Our second speaker is gonna be Dr. Todd Goldie. He is the director of the Evelyn F. and William L. McKnight Brain Institute, or the MBI, where he oversees, champions, and facilitates neuroscience, neuromedicine research programs across the UF Health or UF campus. He is an internationally known expert in the scientific understanding of Alzheimer's disease and has published more than 290 research papers. He currently directs the NIH funded One Florida Alzheimer's Disease Research. The MBI's mission is to broaden the understanding of many neurological and psychiatric disorders and changing them from untreatable to treatable, incurable to curable, and inevitable to preventable. We're very fortunate to have these two amazing researchers leading Alzheimer's research here at UF. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you now, Dr. Dukoski. Thanks very much, Marcia. And thank you all for tuning in today. If I can, may have the first slide. Oh, I need to. Uh, sorry, we start at the back. So there we are. Steve, could you see the first slide? Does everybody see it? I do not. Marsha, you need to. I need to be the presenter. Oh, I need to share my screen. Sorry. Zoom webinar. Share screen. Share. Okay, we should be good now. Great. Okay. So now could everybody. Ladies and, ge ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for your patience. We are going to give you an overview of Alzheimer's disease, both from the standpoint of the development of our understanding from a clinical and clinical research standpoint, and then a bit more about how what we have learned is going to lead us to a, uh, uh, we hope, better ways to treat the disease and hopefully to prevent it as well. Uh, the next slide is uh, my conflicts or my disclosures, as well as Dr. Goldie's. Uh, neither of these has anything to do with the topics that we are discussing today. So we are going to talk about Alzheimer's disease, a bit of history about the disease then and now and imagining for the future. Uh, Dr. Goldie and I have both been engaged in AD research for 30 plus years, and he was kind enough not to put how many plus years I had been doing it, which is higher. Um, but we hope that we can provide you with some insight into the amazing progress that's been made as far as Alzheimer's is concerned and why we're cautiously optimistic. Um, we also want to convey the public policy aspects of this, how important it is that we not only have adequate funding, but that we actually can make partnerships, both public and private, to make things better for the future. So start with something easy. What is Alzheimer's disease? It's a name that we feared, but it is not something that we don't understand. Um, so it's officially defined as an insidious and progressive decline in thinking function. Usually when someone comes in with a memory complaint, they cannot put their finger on exactly when the problem started. But in addition to the slow onset of the clinical manifestations, 
it also starts slowly insidiously in the brain a decade or more before any symptoms emerge. There are two defining characteristics of the of Alzheimer's disease in the brain, amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles made of a protein called amyloid and a protein called tau. Uh, and the classical symptoms are short-term memory decline, difficulty with names, problems with judgment and decision-making, an important reason to get a diagnosis, calculations such as taxing or balancing accounts, sometimes getting lost, uh, and then activities of daily living, the ability to maintain oneself uh, in one's environment. Dr. Alice Alzheimer described the first case of Alzheimer's disease. That's him looking distinguished in the upper right. And his first patient was named August Dieter. That is her at the bottom. And she, you can see, was lost. She kept repeating to herself, I have lost myself. I have lost myself. He described her case. And then he did the pathology after she passed away and demonstrated the first examples of plaques and tangles. This is an example of her writing. In the middle, she tried three times to write Frankfurt where she was, um, uh, where she was living. That was the answer to her, uh, where do you live? Augusta D, you can see she wrote after starting three times. And at the bottom are the finding that Alzheimer made when he did the study of her brain, these ropey thick deposits inside the neurons, uh, which interfered with their ability to function. Next. These are a look at the two uh, objects of interest. On the right side of the blue is an amyloid plaque. It has a core of amyloid and a surround of processes in the brain that aren't supposed to be there that are largely uh, inflammatory as well as different parts of neurons and support cells. On the left is a neuron filled with neurofibrillary tangles. You should not see that neuron. This is an immunofluorescent study. If it didn't have tangles in it, but it does. On the right is uh, just the amyloid in the center that you see, and the golden flames you see are all under a different kind of stain uh, than neurofibrillary tangles. You can see how they choke neurons to death. There's no room inside the cells for anything else. Next slide. There are three kinds of symptoms of the disease. There's the cognitive, or what we refer to usually as the thinking. The functional, very important for getting along in life, and then the behavioral, which sometimes can be a problem. Cognitive involves memory, of course, short-term memory, language, and the ability to describe things or to find the names for things. Uh, executive function, which is what I described earlier about the ability to make decisions, uh, have insight into things, and social cognition, the ability to be aware of where you are and how you do things. The functional things, the activities of daily living include things like managing a checkbook, if anybody uses checkbooks anymore, doing your taxes, making appointments, being able to travel alone. Uh, and then the more uh, simple ADLs, activities of daily living, uh, which are predominantly self-care, which are not lost until later in the disease. And finally, almost in everyone, there is some abnormality of behavior either uh, depression or apathy, sometimes hallucinations or delusions, and occasionally agitation. The agitation usually from something in the environment, which as detectives, we have to track down and remove so that the patient can stay calm. Next slide. So how did we get here? Alzheimer in 1907 described, hold Alzheimer in 1907 described the single case report of Augusta Dieter. And it, he called it presenile dementia. She was 46 when she came to him. And he described it, and it remained described for 70 years as a rare, unusual disease of middle age. Then in the 1960s, Sir Martin Roth, he was knighted by the queen for this work at Newcastle, did a community survey of nursing homes and found that this dementia was a fairly common disease of the elderly. When he stained brains from those cases, he found that the people who were demented in the nursing homes had plaques and tangles and said, well, most of these people with, who are demented who are older have the same disease, except it was noted as senile dementia, a term you may have heard used in the past. And it's very important to know that the majority of cases that we see in late life are a Alzheimer's disease, but many cases show a additional changes in the brain, uh, the uh, vascular changes being the most common. Next slide. In 1976, now we're 10 years after this finding uh, that uh, 
uh, most of the dementia of older people was Alzheimer's disease. Robert Katzman, who was a neurologist in New York, wrote a paper in a neurology journal called The Prevalence and Malignancy of Alzheimer's Disease. He looked at the uh, numbers of uh, the population that was going to grow into late life in the early and mid 21st century and predicted a massive increase in the number of cases of Alzheimer's disease just based on the numbers of people who get the disease. At this point, they said there wasn't any difference between pre-senile and senile onset as far as symptoms or pathology. There are some people who have mutations, which gives them the disease very early in life, in their 40s, let's say. But the cases that show up in the 50s and 60s and 70s, most common as you get older, all the same. This started what became a massive uh, activity to study aging. The National Institute of Aging was established. Uh, Alzheimer's disease, the Alzheimer's disease research centers uh, were begun in uh, 1984. And the Alzheimer's Association was started by eight families who couldn't get care for their family members uh, in Chicago, uh, which has now become a major international force. Next slide. This is what Katzman was concerned about. This is an estimate. Don't pay any attention to the numbers on the left because they change. But what you want to look at is the slope or the rate at which the disease is increasing. Mild cases are outlined with a green color and moderates to severe are in purple. The reason for separating them out is they are very expensive to take care of. Either a family has to give up a job to take care of them full time or hire full time help if they can, or they have to go into a long term care facility. This is what he was concerned about that was going to uh, as we know now, break Medicare all by itself by mid-century if we do not find some way to delay it or stop it. Next slide. And this is the global picture that we all have of uh, what happens in time. There's a decrease in cognitive function at some point when you get into later life. In aging, there are what we call the normal cognitive changes of aging, and those are mild and they're annoying, uh, but they are not uh, really problematic in terms of living your life and your activities of daily living. But in some people who are destined to develop the dementia, they have a preclinical phase in which, as I mentioned, the disease is present in the brain, but they do not look abnormal. But then they begin to slip down to what we call mild cognitive impairment or MCI. These are people who have a memory deficit that is greater than that you expect for age, but they are not demented. Usually they only have problems with one area of their thinking. And then gradually they become uh, uh, diagnosable as Alzheimer's disease or uh, some other dementia because they meet the criteria for the diagnosis. Next slide. This is an overview of what happens over time. Hopefully you are all over here on the left. You're normal. There is that pre-symptomatic state where you have the abnormalities in the brain, but you do not have uh, any clinical symptoms. That is what slips into MCI and then into AD. And the disease in pathology, no disease, no symptoms on the left, amyloid present in the brain, but no symptoms in pre-symptomatic disease, that we can make a diagnosis of pre-symptomatic disease. It doesn't guarantee you will get uh, the cognitive impairments though, that's important to know. Uh, and then the, the changes become a bit greater as they lead to first mild cognitive impairment and then to Alzheimer's. Treatment uh, is what we tr give to patients who have a full-blown disease. Secondary prevention is when you don't have the full-blown disease, but you are on the way to it. And that's what we hope to do in a variety of ways. We'll touch on some of those. Primary prevention, kind of like a vaccine, uh, is the act of giving someone an intervention that prevents them from getting the disease. Next slide. And as you can see, not only is age a big deal, but so is uh, sex and ethnicity. So if you look at this slide, the white bars are the number of people aged 65 to 74 divided into three ethnicities, uh, whites, non-Hispanic whites, African-Americans, Asians and Pacific Islanders, Hispanics, and American Indian and Alaska Natives. The coloring of the bar represents the age group within each of those. And as you can see, there are relatively low levels uh, in 65 to 74, but there is a continuous increase such that by the time you get up to age 85, numbers of people who have this are approaching 40%, 45%. So as you can see, it's a significant risk 
uh, and we desperately want to know not only why these people get this and the others don't, uh, but why the others don't, which may help us try to figure out a way to stop it. Next slide, please. The thing that begins us to uh, pay attention to our own lives with respect to this disease is the fact that, as I mentioned earlier, there are a number of comorbidities with Alzheimer's, that is diseases other than Alzheimer's uh, that are present in people with the disease. And you can see from this chart that there are significant numbers of people with coronary disease who also have diabetes, who also have congestive heart failure, or chronic kidney disease or chronic lung disease and strokes. And interestingly, there aren't as many cancer cases in the AD group, and we still don't understand exactly why, uh, but it keeps uh, bearing out that cancer is not as common in people with AD. And of course, there are exceptions. But when you look at these disorders, some of which are preventable or treatable, trying to keep people either out of these diseases or as mildly affected as possible with good care is a huge issue with respect to trying to slow down the uh, change in people in Alzheimer's disease. Next slide, please. And this is one of the things that helped us do this. This is the ability to see amyloid plaques in the human brain with um, a new, what was new about a decade ago, uh, uh, tracer that is used in a PET scanner that shows the amyloid lighting up in the brain. Uh, on the right, you see a 72-year-old control. He, that person has atrophy, and you see virtually nothing is uh, picked up in the brain that would stick to amyloid. But on the left, also a 72-year-old, and this person has clear-cut Alzheimer's disease. They only have mild disease, but they have a significant amount of the uh, amyloid plaque in their brains. Next slide. If you look at people who are um, cognitively normal across the lifespan. And remember, I showed you how over the age groups that we showed that there was a continuous um, increase in the number of people with the disease. All of these people have normal cognition, but around 60 or so, you see some of these normal cognition people who are characterized by a red dot. Those red dots are people who have a positive amyloid scan. They are, as I said, they are not going to get Alzheimer's. We at first thought that anybody positive would definitely get the disease. Turns out that only about 33% of people who have a positive scan end up getting Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we don't know why they're spared, but we're happy with that. But these are all people who came in, were tested, were normal, and yet when they were scanned, they had an elevation uh, that was in the range of saying this person could have Alzheimer's disease. Next slide. Oh, sorry. These are, these are data um, from uh, Dallas, uh, the data on the, the colored pots, but everybody has data like this. Australia, Pittsburgh, the Mayo Clinic, Washington University, University College London, everyone who's looked at older normals sees the same thing. People carry it in their brains and they're not uh, terribly uh, affected in all cases. The other thing to know about is tau. This is how in the uh, 90s, the neuropathologist showed how the spread of tau is both predictable in Alzheimer's disease, this is the spread of neurofibrillary tangles, and always follows a characteristic place. Starts in the memory banks, or the hippocampus as we call it, and then out onto other memory areas called the anterior temporal cortex, spreads out on the temporal cortex that's right beneath your temple, uh, and then it spreads into the front of the brain and to the back of the brain, always in this direction. And we can correlate the amount of tau there is in the brain with how impaired the person is. Uh, and until very recently, we did not have a way to see this in living people like we now can for Alzheimer's disease, but we do have that now. And I will show that to you in a minute. The reason we're so focused on tau is that tau is called a microtubule associated protein. You can think about the axons. These, by the way, are all filled with tau. These are from Alzheimer's original case as well. You can think about uh, the tau as being like the railroad ties on a railroad. If they are okay, the rails stay together and things can move up and down the processes of the neuron. However, if you were to saw the, the, uh, the rails in half, uh, as soon as you close the, uh, as soon as you ride a train over the rails, you'd see that there was a uh, splaying of the uh, iron rails themselves and nothing could go through. That's what happens when tau becomes abnormal in Alzheimer's. And if you look over at the upper left, you see that tau's job is to wedge itself in between the uh, microtubules, as they're called, and they are the things like the railroad tracks that things get done. When 
tau becomes abnormally uh, changed by a protein called phosphorylation, that lets them fall off of the microtubules and they dissolve. Next click. So, no, go back one. Yeah, so what you see here is that when they come off, all of these begin to uh, distribute themselves into the tissue and you don't have anything going up and down the neuron, almost surely a reason that uh, people have their cognitive impairment and why tau in the brain correlates reasonably well with Alzheimer's disease symptoms. Next slide. We now have a way to see tau in vivo, that is in living people. So on the right is a 59 year old with a perfect score uh, on the mini mental state examination and that person has nothing there. The mild cognitive impairment person has a little bit, you start to see this is in the temporal lobes as was described. Then a person with mild Alzheimer's, it's a mini mental of 21, is a mild case and a severe case, which is filled with tau. And if you look right to the right of that, this is from one of the original neuropathology studies that uh, showed the density of tau in the brain, of neurofibrillary tangles in the brain. And you see it looks very much like that case of the severe Alzheimer's disease that's right next to it. And now we've gone even further. The Brock scores uh, from a, a, a husband and wife team named Edith and Heiko Brock were the ones who did all that work that's in the little drawing. And they characterized these according to the worsening amount or larger amount of neurofibrillary plaques in the brain as stages one through six. The tau uh, pet we have now is so good that we can, even though it was devised in under the microscope in autopsies, we can see it in living people. And what you see down across the bottom are the Brock stages as derived from how much tau people have on a scan while they're alive, while they're living. This was going to be very valuable for us, as is the amyloid scan, in trying to, new, uh, trying to do uh, uh, intervention studies uh, going forward. Next slide. The World Health Organization, along with a lot of other uh, institutions in both uh, the US, well, and all over the world, has guidelines that can reduce the dementia of people or reduce their risk. One is absolutely control blood pressure. The second is control lipids. Get your hypercholesterolemia treated with a statin or some other drug. Keep diabetes under control. And along with it, try to, if you are obese, try to lose weight if you aren't yet watch your weight, not exercising, turns out to be a very, very risky induce, risk inducing uh, function for Alzheimer's disease. Lack of exercise, it turns out exercise is one of the best medicines there is. It's like your mom telling you to eat broccoli. Uh, exercise helps a number of things. And one of the things we have found is that the more exercise people do, the lower their risk of the disease is. And finally, inflammatory states, because although Dr. Uh, Goldie will talk about this in a moment, inflammation in the brain is a significant part of this disease, uh, not like an infection, uh, but just uh, inflammation as the brain tries to fight off the effects of the amyloid and tau. Next slide. Our big news, biggest advance probably of the last 10 years has been not only the brain imaging that I showed you, but MRI is showing volumes of the brain because as the brain shrinks, we can make accurate definitions of uh, what the severity is. And if we have a drug that stops the disease or slows it down, we ought to see a slowing down of any atrophy or any shrinkage of those parts of the brain. In the spinal fluid, which we get with a spinal tap or lumbar puncture, we've been able to determine accurately that amyloid 42 or A beta 42, which is what is the, uh, in the plaque and tau or phospho tau are both changed. The definition of Alzheimer's positive CSF is a low A beta 42. It's low because most of the uh, A beta is tied up in the, in the tangles, or sorry, in the plaques. The amyloid plaques are pulling all of it in. And the tau or the phospho tau, which as I said before, is normally inside neurons, is leaking out of hurt or injured neurons into the spinal fluid. And that's like with a heart attack, it, you leak enzymes and that's how doctors tell if you have tissue damage or not. So spinal fluid has been a very, very valuable thing and, and uh, as has uh, brain imaging, but nobody comes in asking for a spinal tap and PET scans are not only not available everywhere, they're very expensive. So it has been a major target over the past five years, about 10 years to find a blood test. And just within the last several years, 
uh, new kinds of analyses have shown us a way to look at blood levels of A beta 42 and blood levels, especially of phosphotal, that are reliable in saying who has the changes of Alzheimer's disease. They correlate with spinal fluid, they correlate with brain imaging, uh, with uh, PET imaging, and this is a huge advance in terms of not only uh, helping to make a diagnosis, but mainly to be able to quickly screen people to see who now goes into research studies and later who would be given the medications that develop uh, are developed as a result of the research. And I believe, ah, the other thing to say is if you don't believe that exercise, eating well, uh, and um, the other healthy things that people do uh, doesn't help, you can see that the this is a mark of the next 50 years with the millions of people with Alzheimer's disease and people who were born between 1965 and 75 are being projected to level off in a number of years. Keep in mind that everybody who has gotten the disease up to now has been uh, born at an earlier point in time. That is uh, during the war, during the, uh, uh, the depression and the difficult years of the 30s, but now as we've had healthier people, you know that everybody is bigger. We know that from looking at army uniform size from the civil war up to now. And it looks as if we are seeing a decrease in the number of people who will get the disease within that cohort and hopefully going forward. And that is because of health and exercise. Uh, however, we will still have millions of cases because there are so many other uh, people and there still are uh, people who are getting this disorder even if they have exercised and so forth. But this is a sign that some of the things that we do, which are not all high tech or expensive medications, uh, really do have an effect on the overall risk of the disease. Just recently had a paper showing that people with exercise even have some benefit in their thinking function, not necessarily having Alzheimer's, if they begin to exercise even in late life, as long as they're careful and check with their doctor. And I believe it's time to talk about where we will go after all of this that we have found. Dr. Goldie? Well, so I, I thank you, Steve and Dr. Koski, and, and uh, you know, the, the wealth of knowledge in, in your brain about Alzheimer's disease never ceases to amaze me. I learn something new every time I listen to you. So um, uh, the, I'm going to talk about, yeah, I started research in Alzheimer's disease in the mid-1980s, and I think sort of my career path as, you know, investigating Alzheimer's disease and trying to move this towards therapies um, really is, is a lesson and, and, and could highlight um, both the why there's reason to be optimistic and why it's been so challenging. So as Dr. Koski described, the brain is, is filled with both amyloid and tau in Alzheimer's disease, and it's also atrophied. So these are sort of the triad that we talk about, neurodegeneration, amyloid, and tangles. And, and this is just a little different view of what he's showing. Now we've got really good reagents to visualize these. And every one of those little black dots is a plaque in a little fold of your brain. And all this brown stuff is abnormal. That's tau accumulating. And you need all three of these to get Alzheimer's disease. So when I started work in this area as an uh, uh, MD PhD student back in mid the late 1990s, Basically, there was a lot of debate over whether amyloid or tau played a role in this disease. And there was people sort of had their own arguments for this, and they were jokingly almost referred to as religious faith, uh, where people, because tau was shown to be composed of this protein called, uh, or tangles shown to be composed of the protein called tau, they were called Taoist. And the people who believed in beta amyloid in the plaques were called Baptist. Um, but the truth is we really had no way to infer that whether these were just markers of the disease or whether they really played a causal role. And like many things in modern medicine, thankfully genetics came to the rescue. There are rare people who have, uh, where it's clear that Alzheimer's disease is truly heritable, that is, that 50% of the offspring in a family, or if you look, 50% of the individuals in this extended family get Alzheimer's disease. And typically they get it at an earlier age. So instead of getting it at 75 or 80, they're getting it at 55 or 45 or even earlier. And these rare genetic forms of Alzheimer's disease, which are shown over here, 
that will blow frequency in the population. I mean, these are incredibly rare, 0.1% of the, you know, one in a thousand individuals or who come and present with Alzheimer's disease have these. But we found three genes um, one of which is the gene called amyloid protein precursor that in, makes the amyloid beta peptide. Um, the other two genes are involved in clipping the little piece of the amyloid out of this bigger protein. So biology confirmed and really said that these rare genetic forms of Alzheimer's disease told us that a beta is, when it aggregates, is likely to be the trigger of this disease. And I liken this to studies of cholesterol and heart disease. One of the arguments against amyloid that was used in the early days was that people died, as Steve has shown you, you could find somebody who has a, a head full of amyloid and is perfectly normal, but they lacked tau pathology and they lacked neurodegeneration. So today we think in most cases, those people were going to get Alzheimer's disease. They just hadn't gotten there. And then in fact, the same history is there with heart disease where people said, oh, you know, heart, heart disease, there's, you could find cholesterol deposits in people in their 20s in their, in their heart. So it can't cause, you know, heart disease. Well, again, genetics was incredibly important in proving the role of cholesterol in lipid metabolism or heart disease. Similarly, genetics was helpful in determining that the causal insult in Alzheimer's disease is this initial trigger of tau. And in fact, the, one of the, the biggest genetic risk factors for any disease is something called apolipoprotein and E in Alzheimer's disease, where having one of three flavors, there are two, three sort of common forms, E2, E3, and E4, um, about 17, 15 to 17% of the population has one allele of E4. And if you have that one allele, you're at about three-fold risk for Alzheimer's disease, and about 50% of all Alzheimer's disease cases have an E4 allele. If you're one of the unlucky ones to have two copies of this allele, then basically you're almost like you, you could escape this, but they're very few. And so the risk is somewhere like tenfold. And you'll see a whole bunch of other genes down here that I've listed, and that's what we're really trying to understand the biology of. We know that many of these contribute to the risk of Alzheimer's disease, but that risk is relatively low in any given individual, so you could see it at the population level. But what's very interesting about these sort of uh, what we call low risk or rare variants, there's sort of two varieties, is many of them converge upon the immune system. So it looks like that uh, having uh, genetic variants within your immune system can modulate the risk, either good or bad, for Alzheimer's disease. But a simple way, based on this genetic data and the pathology that Steve showed you, which we can now visualize in living humans, and I cannot stress how much of a, an advance this was, the only way we could determine whether you truly had Alzheimer's disease 25 years ago was for you to die and come to autopsy and a neuropathologist look at your brain. So being able to see these pathologies in living humans is a huge advance. So really the guiding framework for Alzheimer's disease that we have now is that A beta accumulates in the brain over many years, and this leads to tau accumulation, inflammation, and other downstream pathologies, which eventually lead to brain cell loss, dysfunction, and dementia and what I like to call eventually brain organ failure. Your brain stops functioning appropriately. So a simple way to visualize how we would go about therapeutics and why we were so excited when all this genetic data implicated A beta back in the early 19 and mid 1990s was that, hey, we prevent amyloid accumulation, we prevent this disease and you never get it. And I can't tell you how much optimism there was at that time in the field that we were just going to knock this off. We might be getting there today, but it's been a long and winding road and presented more challenges than I think we would have, either Steve or I would have predicted back then. So that's sort of, you know, I'm, I'm describing then to now. I've, I've talked about, you know, and I think Steve set the stage for having a real tangible progress in our understanding of what Alzheimer's is. The sequencing of events, and I'll lay these out even further, that of, as AD progresses, and the ability to detect these events in living humans.
I can tell you though, there's still many gaps that we don't understand. For example, a logical one would be, well, amyloid deposition occurs and then you get tau, tau pathology, why? Well, we don't have an answer to that, but we're trying to find those. Um, we also know that, that we've, over many years, developed a variety of interventions that can now target these underlying pathologies, be it amyloid. Uh, I think we're a little further along in that, we, but we, there are ways that we could begin to target tau. Um, and we've also developed modestly effective therapies that impact symptoms of the disease. But then again, we've had hundreds of failed therapeutic studies as well. And the holy grail of this is to really alter the disease course, not just improve symptoms. And nothing yet today has been approved. So the bottom line is there's still a huge unmet medical need. So what's the, the, the best news I could probably give is that Alzheimer's disease has finally captured the public attention and public policy has changed dramatically to really reflect that one, we could probably do something about this disease if enabled, and, and two, to put the funds behind it that have, will, will help that. I created this slide, I don't know, 20 years ago, probably, about the faces of, of disease. And, and I, I point this out because Magic Johnson, I think most people know who Magic Johnson is, it was HIV positive in 1991. The HIV virus was only identified in the early 1980s. And yet we were able to develop effective therapies and Magic Johnson is still alive today. Um, in contrast, there's President Reagan um, who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in 1994. And based on the natural history of the disease that Steve showed you, we know that he had it much earlier, or at least the underlying pathologies. But even until six years ago, the amount of money that we were spending at a national level to uh, combat AIDS um, in terms of research and drug development was about $3 billion. For Alzheimer's disease, it was $400 million. And due to advocacy and successful lobbying, that number now is approaching $2 billion or more this year. So I think the, the, this fact that we recognize that this is a huge public health problem that many of us will face as we age and the public policy decisions I think bode well for the future. Um, so not only that, you know, I think the balance has shifted from this idea of denial, inaction, and inevitability. Hey, you know, uh, grandma, or grandpa's getting older. That you know, they're they're losing a little bit of their cognitive function. That's okay. We recognize that that isn't. Nobody wants to lose their cognitive function as they get older. So this is the balance has shifted to awareness, engagement, action, and funds. Um, not only at the national level, um, but through efforts of some um, private citizens and, and our state legislatures, the, the state of Florida almost put no money into research in Alzheimer's disease at 2010. Um, but due to the actions of many state representatives, the current governor and past governors, uh, this has changed and there is now uh, uh, more funding for Alzheimer's disease research in the state. And in clearly at the national level to recognize this as the huge problem and increase the funding is um, dramatic. Um, you know, these funds and awareness impact us locally. I like to say that Florida is the epicenter or one of the epicenters of the Alzheimer's epidemic in, in the United States. Of the five to six million people who have it, nearly 10% of those live in Florida. That's because we our place where people like to come and retire. And we have a large population of elderly individuals who either, uh, you know, who are more at risk to have Alzheimer's disease. And um, this is translated into efforts that um, Steve was vital in, in, in helping. Um, but we, along with our partner institutions of uh, Mount Sinai Medical Center, University of Miami, FAU and FIU, were awarded one of these Alzheimer's disease research centers, which Dr. Dukoski had previously led at the University of Pittsburgh and University of Kentucky, and I currently lead this effort. But it really is a team designed to build infrastructure to support Alzheimer's research and also do community awareness. And this is funded by the National Institute of Aging at the National Institute of Health. And so we're the only center primarily based in Florida that is it's an Alzheimer's disease research center and compared to California, for example, where they have seven of these and almost the same number of people with Alzheimer's. 
So what are we trying to do in this One Florida Alzheimer's Disease Research Center? Well, we're, we're trying to really look at this in a more diverse population. Much of what we know about Alzheimer's disease and that Dr. Dukoski so beautifully laid out has come from the study of people that look like Steve and I, the Caucasians of Northern European descent. Um, so why are these other uh, uh, groups of individuals at different risk for Alzheimer's disease? And why does the progression look different? And that's really the focus of, of our Alzheimer's disease research center. And it's really helped by the diverse populations of our colleagues at the uh, throughout the state who are who are recruiting and evaluating individuals not only of northern european descent but african americans and hispanics so the next question is why don't we have better treatments god we've made we we, we really seem to get this disease so why has it been so hard to to get the disease i mean to get interventions so one is, it's really the time course of the disease. Steve laid this out, but really didn't put a, a, a clear timeline on it. But what we know is that you have many risk factors that are perhaps lifelong risk factors in terms of your genetics that somehow trigger this accumulation of A-beta in the brain. But that, a trigger, that initial accumulation, it looks like it occurs 20 or more years before you show symptom onset. And it also takes a long time, perhaps five or 10 years before that a accumulation of amyloid or a beta in the brain triggers these other changes that we are think are more relevant towards getting the symptoms of dementia. For example, tau. You don't see tau until you've had amyloid in your brain for a long time. It explains why some people die and have a head full of amyloid and aren't demented. But what we've been trying to do, and I like to use an analogy to uh, cholesterol-driven heart disease, is, is we've been trying to treat people at the symptomatic phase with things that largely have targeted A-beta. And in, when that A-beta has been laid, laid down for 30 years and you've had all this damage, that may now be independent of that initial trigger. So one of the things we need to do better as a field is to align our studies so that when we treat individuals, we're treating the pathology at the right time in the disease, and we're using the wrong, right drug. In some cases, sometimes people put things into the clinic because of there was a great of this unmet medical need, and really the science behind those wasn't that good. But I think we have a much better understanding of this. And in fact, there are heroic efforts from some of our colleagues who are now doing true prevention studies, where they're trying to detect individuals with this earliest stage of amyloid accumulation, and then target it in the brain. And we think those are likely to have a much bigger effect size than targeting amyloid at the later stages of the disease, where it's not really clear whether that's going to work. We've had a lot of failures. The truth is there are lots of new therapies being tested at various stages of the disease. These target not only the amyloid or tau pathologies, but they target neurodegeneration, they target inflammation, they target neuronal loss. But in many cases, despite this intense effort and hundreds of hundreds of trials, we've had a lot of failures. And one of the challenges in Alzheimer's disease is those failures are expensive failures because many drugs are not whittled through this typical sort of what on the outer circle is what things are in the early phase. So just looking at whether they're toxic or not. And then early studies on efficacy in phase two. And then we get to what's called phase three, where you could actually prove whether a drug or not works. And many of you might be familiar with this as all the debate about coronavirus vaccines, because until they're proven to work in phase three, you really don't know that they do. But we have a lot of shots on the goal. And I'm going to talk about one, which we hope is uh, successful. Um, but this is a, actually a biologic. It's an antibody and it targets amyloid. And I think you could again see this, these people who start before they get treatment with this antibody, they have a head full of amyloid. Afterwards, it looks like it's being cleared again with the PET tracer. We'd like to have other ways to confirm it, but, but on the face value of this, this antibody looks like it's capable of clearing away the amyloid that's accumulated. This drug is currently being evaluated by the FDA for approval because it does show a little bit of an effect on cognitive function and activities of daily living when it was tested in people with early stages of Alzheimer's disease. Interestingly, 
there's a lot of writing on this, and this is the company Biogen who has this drug. I'm not trying to endorse it or not, but earlier this year, they'd actually announced, or in 2019, they'd announced, oh, we don't think the drug's working in, a, in a, what they call an interim analysis of the trial. And look what happened to their stock. They lost roughly $80 billion of value. And then later that year, they went back and looked at the value with, at the data again with a little more data. And they said, wait, it does look like it's working. So we're going to now pursue for filing at the FDA and their value change. So their big stakes are riding on this. I just think it's, it's a pretty dramatic illustration of, of the hopes of people. And, and, but I think for both Steve and I, we feel that if this was being tested earlier and earlier in the disease course, it, it wouldn't be ambiguous about whether it's working or not. Um, so I'm just going to wrap up. I'm not going to get down in the weeds here about what we're doing at UF, um, we, you know, because it really is very detailed. But through the having a one Florida Alzheimer's disease research center and leading that, we're expanding access to clinical trials and research for for people interested in this. We have a brain bank. So if you're we're especially interested in looking at why are people who get into their 90s and have preserved brain health, what what does their brain look like and the limited studies have been done in this area. We think there's still work to do. Um, we we're, we're, have a, a large group of researchers, 75 faculty and hundreds of staff that support these studies, where we're really trying to understand these gaps in our knowledge that we think could impact future development of therapeutics or when to intervene. We're developing novel therapies that target the amyloid tau and neurodegeneration that accompany Alzheimer's disease. And one of the things that we think is, is really important is by the time you have symptoms of the disease, we're not sure that targeting any one of these alone is really going to work. So we're trying to build a roadmap that does not exist now for developing these combinatorial therapies and identifying combinations of interventions that could work. And then others here are working on non-drug-based interventions that may impact quality of life and memory decline. So there are things like physical activity or behavioral interventions that we think we could do in the, in, in the meantime, or developing new technologies and devices that might help somebody with cognitive impairment to function better. And then, especially, I'm, I'm really intrigued by this very initial effort. We're really trying to, to build some infrastructure to ask, why do some people live into their 90s and avoid Alzheimer's pathologies and have normal cognitive function? And though there are other studies like this, they've been called over 90 or centenarian studies of super agers, they've been done on very small scale. And we'd like to do one at the scale of tens of thousands of people in the age of Florida. And we've got a way to identify those now. And we know that there are a lot of people in the state over 90 who seem to have good brain health. And we'd like to be able to contact them and get biological samples so we can figure out why, because maybe it will be easier to figure out if they're protected, how to protect all of us from getting this des devastating disease. So sooner rather than later, the right drug at the right time might be identified, and we may be even doing it right now. But in the meantime, what can you do to help? Well, I think we can't sustain this without this, you know, a, a protracted increase, this, this sustained funding that we've had. So please feel free to contact your state and national legislatures and tell them that you support these efforts to maintain and even further increase funding for Alzheimer's disease. And, and again, most of this, what we really need to know is not looking at a mouse model or a cell model in a dish of Alzheimer's disease. We need to look at this disease in people. So, you know, please try to participate and support research efforts locally and nationally. And so I'd like to leave you with a thought of, imagining together, not one of us alone, but together as a group, we will change our understanding of Alzheimer's disease from being inevitable, largely untreatable and incurable to preventable, treatable and curable. And I'll just leave this up. I'm not gonna, um, if you'd like to find out more about our activities in the One Florida Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, that links here, but there are a number of organizations that um, you know, all, the Alzheimer's Association uh, provides huge amounts of information. If, if people are more in the medical field, there's a very nice website called altsforum.org where one can stay abreast of research updates and see comments from researchers on what those really mean. And if you're worried about your own 
a family member's or friend's cognitive health, please feel free to contact U of Health and we'll, we'll try to help you get a timely referral. Again, we'd like to restrict questions here to not those individual questions, but broader questions about the disease and, and approaches and, and not really get down in the weeds on an, on an individual's case or, or course. Um, and so I'll stop there and thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you guys for those presentations. They were remarkable. We've had several questions that have come in and I'm gonna go ahead and um, read them now and I'll let you guys decide who's gonna be the best person to um, answer that. One of the first questions we have is, do you have any tips for seniors with Alzheimer's to cope with the social isolation during the pandemic? Doing what we're doing now is probably, you know, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a hard one and, and in fact, we're, uh, part of our, we've, we've had some supplemental funding for our Alzheimer's Disease Research Center to look at this. We understand how social isol isolation of the elderly can cause increased stress. It stresses us all. Um, and we're, um, you know, it, it, but it's a real challenge. The, you know, the elderly individuals are much more at risk for having a severe course of, of COVID. And if they contract it and need to really do what they can to maintain social distancing and health. So I, I think, you know, contact by Zoom and, and other, you know, social media over the net is, is about the as good as we could do. But also, you know, the, your risk if you go outside and can maintain your physical activity, I think is, is, is minimal, especially if you wear a mask. I think we know that. Um, and, you know, it's not, it's not zero. But um, I think that, you know, you, one needs to make a decision in their own mind about, um, you know, relative risk and certainly uh, not maintaining physical health is, is probably a bigger risk than trying to wear a mask, social distancing when you're exercising outside or in your home um, in a safe environment. But I, 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 it's a real challenge and Steve should weigh in because I don't, I don't think, I think all of us you know, at, at every level of our lives are still deal, de, dealing with the impacts of this if we take it seriously, which we should. Well, I think that uh, the first comment Todd made is absolutely right, that isolation can only be fought off by contact with other people. To the extent that you have family members or friends who are uh, having a problem with their isolation, then Telephone calls, uh, especially Zoom, where they can see you, perhaps with grandchildren and so forth, or if you see them, uh, are really useful things to do. There also is an ancient form of communication called writing a letter. And uh, I'm told that this used to be a major way that people talk to each other uh, before everyone walked around with their uh, iPhones in front of them, tripping over things. But any kind of communication, whether it's a phone call, a, a letter, a thinking of you, this has long lasting effects, much longer than we would think it would. For people who are lonely also, if you've got an interesting book or an interesting uh, TV show that you have uh, uh, gotten into, that would be helpful to suggest uh, because now everyone is trading uh, back and forth good movies and good series to watch. Uh, uh, finally, it never hurts to send food. Food is love. All right, those are some good tips there, yeah. You can actually call people on a phone too, you know, in addition to letter writing. People forget. Oh, there's that, yes, sorry. Yeah, you can actually speak on the phone. It's not just for typing, typing messages yes, to each I, other. I heard someone say that uh, his uh, phone is an app on his phone. <laughs> um, let's see, what is the best way to respond to someone who's made the same comment or question repeatedly? Well, I'll let, I'll let Steve handle that one because I think he's probably better at, at stating it, but it's, there's a tool called redirection and I think he could explain that a little yeah. more, probably a good way to handle it. I think you can, there are two things to remember. Number one, that this is expected behavior. Uh, this not only is uh, uh, something that happens to most people with the disease, especially if their memory loss is most prominent, but it's going to happen and you need to know it, which sometimes makes it a little easier to tolerate. 
after you have answered it two or three times enough to know that it's the same question coming back, what Todd described is what's called redirection is what we try to do. You answer it again, and then you redirect the person to something else, whether it's um, depending on the severity of their disease, some task which would help them putting dishes away, folding laundry, folding towels, especially, which turns out to be good even for people who have a, a significant deficit, but redirecting them to something else, usually or hopefully something pleasant, uh, is the best way to deal with this because you will not have an end to this uh, by thinking, well, if I answer it five times, then you know he'll be satisfied and he'll stop. The brain, remember, is doing its best to work in spite of the disease. It's, it's not the disease talking. It's the brain trying to do its thing. It wants to know what's going on, and it cannot uh, encode. It cannot remember what you said before. What it does remember, though, is the thing it wanted to ask you about. So it's, it's, it's your brain trying to figure out uh, how to work around this problem. And of course, it's something that most people are not aware of if they get to the point of repetitive questioning. Okay, kind of a similarly related question. Um, how, how is it best to respond to a negative comment from a loved one when the comment isn't true? Well, I, I mean, I could, I think we, <laughs> we, if you know that person has cognitive impairment, I think, you know, you, you, you know that, that it's just, I think you have to recognize that, that they're not thinking in, in the way that they would. And, and likelihood is if they have moderate or severe Alzheimer's disease, they, they won't remember that comment in any length, for any length of time. And again, so the re purpose of redirecting, trying to get them focused on something else, you know, in another activity is, is a good way. And they'll, they, it probably won't impact them as much as it's impacting you if you're the one with intact cognition at that time. But it's, it's challenging. And, and I think that, you know, especially for families, the broader question here is, you know, that the, the hardest thing that may happen in, in the course of this disease is when do you need help in terms of deciding, one, in-house help, can you afford it, you know, for, I mean, if, if I, I worry greatly about those people, with people who have means, they often can deal with some of these issues, or they could get you know, assist people into an assisted care facility, et cetera. But it's really challenging when it's all on the family and especially when people get agitated. And there are some interventions that can be done. They're behavioral that could help. Um, they're, they're not probably too complex to get into now, um, but there are also some possibilities of medications that are new and been recently approved for some of those symptoms of agitation and aggression. Um, but again, those decisions really need to be made with a healthcare provider, not through this kind of interaction. Sure. Well, I, kind of along those questions, we got a, a question, uh, a couple of medication related questions. One question is, why isn't CBD oil being used for dementia people? It does work as a calming agent, they go to add. Um, I, I think that the there are trials being done with various cannabinoid derivatives. I'm not aware of one particularly with CBD, although I, I haven't looked at that carefully. Um, but until, you know, if, until it's proven to work in a, a placebo controlled trial, we don't really know whether it works, but if that's really an individual's decision to make, and I think I'll, I'll let Steve chime in there because he may have a more specific answer than that. Well, um... There's a lot of controversy about whether CBD oil really works uh, to do all of the things that uh, it is claimed to be able to help. Uh, I've had it given to me for back pain by one of my well-meaning colleagues. Uh, the, the problem is that um, specifically for the issue of trying to calm agitated people down, these are incredibly difficult trials to do. The reason is that if you have someone who gets agitated, as I said, detective work is first. Find out if you can what it is that agitates them. Is it people walking slowly by the house with their dogs? Is it somebody walking by their room if they're living in a facility? But to do a study uh, on agitation takes um, 
having someone who gets agitated enough that you could see the effect of a medication, but not too much so that they would have to be treated urgently with whatever the doctor would treat them with, usually a tranquilizer of some sort. So doing these studies can't be underestimated. The good news appears to be that uh, as far as we can tell, uh, CBD oil does not um, have a major toxic effect. So it is probably not, um, my rules about taking what we call uh, complementary medications are that it can't be too expensive. Uh, it cannot interfere with any of the medications that you're taking uh, and you cannot be um, uh, allowed to take it despite the fact that it either doesn't work or it may potentially cause harm. So I don't see anything wrong with doing it, but I think it will take a few small studies by people showing that this is really a possible way uh, before a large scale study would be done because it would take a large scale study to really um, prove that it worked. There are a lot of reports that it works to calm people down that doesn't guarantee that it would work in any other particular case. Uh, I think we'd have to leave it at that because we're just not along far enough with this particular compound. Okay, another medication related question. Are there any uh, new medications that are not antipsychotics? Maybe something a little more natural? Uh, well, for what, I guess, is the, is the question. If that's about um, agitation. I, I think uh, it's just to, to treat Alzheimer's in general. Well, we don't, yeah, you know, we don't treat uh, Alzheimer's disease with antipsychotics. In fact, we'd like to treat them with as few medications other than uh, either a cholinesterase inhibitor, of which there are three approved, you can only use one though, uh, or um, at either or or with memantine, which is another neurotransmitter booster uh, that helps uh, people's uh, function. So you would only use a calming agent uh, like an antipsychotic in the case where someone had behaviors that really were either not controllable or were leading to families, for example, saying, gee, I cannot take care of him anymore at home like this, I need to have a medication. So there are, depending on uh, how severe the person is, several medications beside what we classically call antipsychotics. Some of the newer antipsychotics are a little bit better. Uh, and some of the old ones, which uh, very frequently are used just to induce sleep, uh, sometimes just a touch will really be helpful. Uh, there are also some other kinds of drugs on the way that are better uh, drugs for calming. Again, I'm assuming this is for agitation or calming people down. Uh, but the major thing to remember about any of these drugs is low and slow, that you start with a very low dose, even if it's below the lowest recommended dose of the medication, and you only increase it very slowly and leave it at a steady date, uh, dose long enough to see whether or not it's having the desired effect. That usually would mean uh, at least two or three days before you made a determination that it wasn't helping or that it was somehow making people worse. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another question. Is there a blood test that I could ask for for Alzheimer's? No. Um, the, the blood test data that we were talking about and the advances that Todd were talking about are exciting because of what they imply and because we've been looking for them for a decade. We've always dreamed of a blood test, but they're still experimental. Uh, more data is, in, uh, is moving along and the, 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 the assay, the way the blood is tested is a new technology that is not available say in every hospital where we would love to have it someday. So until there are standards and until the FDA approves the study uh, the, uh, the test for uh, use in the US at least, they would have to have enough of these abilities to do the essay all over the country uh, and then it would be approved. Someone who is concerned they have Alzheimer's disease should talk to their doctor or to one of the specialty clinics um, because there are studies you can participate in if you have a reason to be highly concerned and if you don't, uh, my advice is all the good stuff your mother told you, go out and play, uh, eat your broccoli. They can't all be gems. Uh, exercise, get a good night's sleep. It turns out sleep is a very big deal for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, people who do not get as much sleep, if you look at a whole population, 
are more likely to develop the disease than people who uh, get a good night's sleep. And they define a good night's sleep as uh, seven hours to uh, nine hours. And uh, I don't know how many people get to sleep that much, but I think it would be terrific. No wonder they are relatively spared. Uh, so there are things to do to prevent it. It's also a question of why do you want to know? Because the question any physician should ask is, okay, what will you do if you find out that this test is negative or that this test is positive? Sure. I, I would also add just the, you know, some people might, who are concerned about Alzheimer's disease, probably have gone to 23andMe and got their genetics back. And the risk for Alzheimer's disease that's predicted by that test is basically attributable to having this ApoE4 ApoE. or not. And so even if it doesn't say that clearly, that's what it is. Um, and, and so, um, but remember, even if you have an ApoE4 allele, it doesn't mean that you are invariably going to get Alzheimer's disease. It just means you have increased risk. Okay. That's a good point to make. Thank you. A um, couple more questions. Well, we have a lot more questions, actually. What causes um, a patient's con concentration and memory to fluctuate from hour to hour and day to day? What causes that fluctuation? Well, that's a great question. Are, Let Steve take it on. Yeah, thanks, Todd. Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy to get all the hard ones here. Thank you. So um, you saw the, the, the example that I showed of how uh, once tau starts having its effects on the brain, that it leads to a disassembly or at least an injury to the structure of the microtubules that provide uh, information going up and down the processes of the neurons. And so it doesn't happen all at once, like someone swung an ax and cut it. It happens slowly. During the times that it is happening and at the same time the brain is trying to repair it, you're sometimes going to get things that go through and sometimes things just don't go through. Or because timing is very important for signals that go between different regions of the brain, things come in just like they should, but they don't get there exactly at the right time. And that leads to a little confusion. I tell people often that it's kind of like a car that is skipping and then catches and runs smoothly and then may catch again and sputter and then catch again. That is really what happens from a biological and an electrophysiological standpoint in the brain. The brain, as I said before, is trying to work in spite of the disease. And when the disease is causing an abnormality uh, that is slow in progression, you're going to see changes like this. The other thing that can cause this are medications that people take, uh, sometimes medications that they have taken for a long time uh, or medications people take to sleep uh, will interfere with their thinking function and cause them to wax and wane. A major thing people take to sleep, uh, for those of you listening, is uh, diphenhydramine or Benadryl. Uh, lots of older people use it to sleep. It is a drug that affects memory function. That's why it says don't take this if you're sleepy or if you're going to be driving. And it will have some effects on patients with Alzheimer's disease where they would not be as good as they otherwise would be. So another reason to try and get sleep perhaps after a good exercise. But um, th th there is this sense that the brain is doing its best to fight its way back to normalcy when it gets interrupted, you look for things that might have caused it, such as a metabolic or a medication change, and then otherwise it is just part of the disease process. Sorry, forgot about muted. Uh, can you tell us about the AHEAD study being conducted locally by the Mayo Clinic and other facilities? Do you know anything about that? Yes, the, the HEAD study is a, a study being done jointly by the National Institute of Aging and uh, uh, with medications and support from ASI Pharmaceuticals uh, in Tokyo. There is a medication that is still under trial uh, called uh, BAN2401. Uh, Todd knows a great deal about this particular medication. I believe it is still in some trials, hasn't gotten any kind of a, um, a yes or no from its trials yet. However, um, it's being given in its current state in either mild cognitive impairment or mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease. The AHEAD study is looking at people who may be at risk of Alzheimer's but don't have any symptoms. So this would be a prevention study 
uh, which is going to be done all over the world. Uh, I think there are multiple places across Asia, Europe, and the United States that are doing the study. So if very similar to the data I talked about, about aticunumab, the antibody, mm -hmm. which is able to apparently alter the pre-existing amyloid deposits and have some impact on functionality when people have Alzheimer's disease. The, this particular trial is testing another antibody that's quite similar, um, which looks like it could do something similar. But in this case, they're doing what we really should do is test it earlier. And, and the only thing you, I mean- what Earlier you, in the course of the disease. Yeah, yeah. What, yes. what you really worry about in those um, you want a lot of data, and, and this has hurt the field. There have been other agents that target amyloid that people were very hopeful about that were small molecules, so classic drugs. Um, and despite lots of testing, they, didn't, they seemed to be well tolerated. And then when we gave them to people in prevention studies very early on, they showed impairment of cognition, surprisingly. Um, so we don't know why. Um, and there may be workarounds, but it was very disappointing for the field and, and shows you how hard it is when you're trying to treat somebody 15 or 20 years before they get the disease and how safe a drug has to be. And, and that's one of the challenges we face. If we're going to do preventative therapy, it needs to be very safe. You don't want to make people worse by trying to intervene to prevent them from getting Alzheimer's. And not only that, but not everybody who is in a prevention study is going to get the disease anyway. So the, as you said, this, the, the, the bar is very high to make sure that things are safe. Um, but the first place we try drugs, of course, is in people who have the disease because they are the ones of most immediate need. Um, and as we have learned more and more about the points that Dr. Goldie mentioned, uh, we're learning that like many other diseases, the earlier you can get to it, at least the more theoretical is the uh, chance for improvement. Okay. We um, have a couple other uh, pretty good questions here. What excites you most about what UF is doing to fight dementia and how is that work being funded? Well, I could add sort of- You can start, uh, Todd. Yeah, I think, I mean, the great thing is we've had over the last 10 years, there's been a tremendous growth of researchers studying Alzheimer's disease on campus. Um, there's something like $30 million of NIH funding that directly supports research in this area. So the National Institute of Health is the largest supporter. Uh, we've been getting about a million dollars from state funds a year directly to support our Alzheimer's disease research center and that. Um, but so it's, it's hard to put on any single item. What I would say is that it, a, a single individual is not going to take on this disease. It's going to be the team. And we've got a great team that works together here. And we've got lots of new things that are getting closer. Um, my laboratory developed a therapy that targets the stress pathway. And there's evidence that increased stress might increase your risk for Alzheimer's disease and also might accelerate both the amyloid and tau pathologies. And so this is a completely novel way to try to take on Alzheimer's disease. And it also may do a lot of other things on, on, that are good for people. But um, so I'm ex personally excited about that. But you know, it, 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 I'm more excited by the breadth and the collaboration and the number of really cool, new, innovative things and ways to think about the disease that we, we've now had 30 years of history of, of really, again, not, not as much success as we'd like. And that's forced us to think really hard about what we're doing and our approaches to this. So I, I just add that there, I think, you know, there's everything from very cool non-pharmacologic interventions, electrical, you know, like almost a nine volt battery stimulation of the brain, group therapies that are designed to provide caregiver support as well as perhaps alterations in, in just behaviors that help to devices that might help people navigate the field to the kind of molecular stuff that my lab does where, for example, uh, and other colleagues where we're trying to engineer the, the scavenger cells in the brain to eat amyloid and tau. 
that this is sort of stuff that's been done in cancer. So there's a whole bunch of things and a lot of it's pretty esoteric, but I think it's pretty cool. And we've got a really good team. Yeah. So I, I'd add just two things. First, Todd has united a group of some of the best people in the state uh, at multiple universities uh, and at Mount Sinai uh, in Miami Beach. It's always nice to have a site in Miami Beach. And these are first rate researchers who have really just Im immensely expanded the, our ability to do research both in basic science and in clinical. The other thing that really excites me about this one, this is my third ADRC. I ran one for 14 years uh, in, at the University of Pittsburgh. This one has as a major focus outreach to ethnic and racial groups beyond just the classic uh, bald white guy like uh, me. And I think that that is, to me, having worked in this field, having grown up basically with Alzheimer's uh, since I started my career, nobody knew what it was, as Todd well knows. The idea that we are finally getting things out to all people so that we can say with a guarantee that we know that whatever this treatment is, it's not just going to work on blonde haired, blue eyed people from uh, Brazil, but it's going to work in anyone, uh, to me would be a huge victory. To have us focused on that, uh, that to me is the, one of the best things about our center. Okay. Um, is UF studying any cortical thinning as a marker for Alzheimer's disease? And can you elaborate on that study? So, um, in the Almost all of them do. Yeah. Sorry, Todd, go ahead. Yeah, well, in the context of our Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, we do imaging and look at um, and have some in our, in collaboration, David Valencourt leads our imaging effort here and others, but it, it's a pretty standard measure now. Uh, and we also, but we also use even more advanced techniques that are available in the, in, a, in an MRI to look at how tracks connect from one part of the brain to another. Uh, another interesting measure that's, um, we're not quite sure what it means, but it tracks with disease, for example, in Parkinson's really well is something called free water. So it's probably where you, when you have degeneration, you actually have, that gets filled with water in your brain or, or that's how it's detected on the signal. So I think the answer is yes. And we're doing this across the spectrum of the a continuum of Alzheimer's disease from people who are cognitively normal to when they have dementia, along with all the other biomarkers, both imaging and blood, so that we could put the whole picture together. And I think that's what's really cool now is, you know, Steve didn't say this, but he should take credit. He led the, the first study that um, with his colleagues, Chet Mathis and Bill Clunk at the University of Pittsburgh that developed that first imaging agent for imaging tau in the human brain. And, and what, what, you know, I mean, it, it, there's a long history there, but it, it was like when, when we were able to see that as a field, we were like, this is, this is a game changer. And so now when we could put the whole picture together, it's really a game changer because we could sort of, we'll be able to, in, it's not quite prime time yet, but I predict within five years, you'll be able to say, you're at this stage of Alzheimer's disease and hopefully then we'll be able to start aligning our treatments with that particular stage in a way where they'll be most effective. So we know that everybody, it was amyloid, by the way, folks, not Tal. Tal was relatively recent. This was, but amyloid was a huge thing for all of the good reasons that Todd mentioned that we wanted to be able to detect. The idea that um, uh, you could place a person back into a scanner and a couple of years later measure the difference in the volume of their brain has all occurred since roughly 2000. At first, it was a mouth dropping experience to subtract change from one person to another, and it would take two years before you could see it. Within five years, you could track changes every six months in people who had the disease moving right along compared to people who were normal. So now, as Todd said, we do it as a denominator on everyone. Uh, we use it to, to uh, help us with the, with the PET scans that look at the actual proteins. But we have found that physicists have done so much more of interest that allows us to look at axons, that the, the processes that we were talking about and see if they're injured or not 
free water is another indication of tissue injury. So although we all know MR from the cool pictures that show up on television, uh, that particular technique has given us a wealth of other information. And as he said about Parkinson's, not just about Alzheimer's disease, but about almost all brain disease. Okay, uh, a couple questions that we have that came in about um, the incidence or, or things that increase your inc incidence. Does a traumatic brain injury or would general anesthesia, either of those make you more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease? There was a fuss, um, I want to say about 10 years ago about anesthesia. There was someone who reported that there were more plaques in people who had gotten anesthesia. That has since been shown multiple times to not be true. Uh, so it is not true that general anesthesia uh, uh, accelerates the rate of developing the disease. Uh, and I hope that's true because I'm having a surgery next week. Uh, but it is true that it does not cause a problem. Um, what was the other question? Uh, uh, traumatic sorry, brain injury. TBI. TBI. Yeah. Well, the short answer to this is we don't know. There are certain things that happen with multiple injuries, what happens with football players or boxers that lead to uh, what we call a tauopathy. That is, they develop tau uh, protein in deposition in the brain, neurofibrillary tangles. It's not exactly the same way as Alzheimer's disease, but because it's the same protein going bad, uh, we are very concerned about it. However, to my knowledge, we have not yet shown that it leads you to develop the disease. What it may do is if you've had a severe injury, lower your resistance if you were not going to get it because your brain was strong enough to fight it off, but then you bring down your resistance or your resilience to disease because you've banged your head many times, it may manifest itself because you've had that history. Uh, but we do not know yet that especially a single um, uh, trauma, uh, even a moderately severe one, would cause the disease later on or force it to show up. In fact, we were just having a discussion about that this morning about how to do research uh, on this particular question. Okay, um, can you tell us more about the primary prevention and secondary prevention practices? Are they already in use or only in clinical trials? Well, they had been in several, go ahead, Todd. Well, go ahead, Steve, I'll let you go, you go. There have, there have been a couple of- This is your field house, so. Yeah, there have been a couple of trials, uh, the most famous one being the FINGER trial in uh, Scandinavia where um, they did studies looking at exercise and at um, uh, uh, healthy eating and a variety of interventions and showed that indeed people had less of a decline in their cognitive function leading to lower risk of Alzheimer's disease. That has been shown in a number of prospective pro studies, uh, but it's also been shown in a ton of people if you do surveys of what they eat, how much they exercise, uh, in large populations of people who are followed, uh, that the people who do those things uh, don't have as much Alzheimer's disease. That is, it appears to be protective. So it's now at a point where there are so much data, uh, there are so much data that, uh, that the exercise, right eating, hypertension control especially, are preventive that those are straightforward recommendations. Um, uh, a prevention with, for example, a medication, such as the trial we talked about before, the AHEAD trial, uh, are in all likelihood going to be reserved for people who already have amyloid discovered in their brain or have a very strong family history, for example, the genes that, uh, that Todd had described that greatly increase your risk. Uh, but at this point, there is no reason not to get good sleep, eat right, control your blood pressure, control your lipids, uh, and uh, uh, make sure you get a good night's sleep. Uh, we do know lack of sleep helps to clog up the exits for amyloid to get out of your brain. And so uh, ever since I heard that, I've been going to bed an hour earlier. <laughs> okay, kind of along those lines of um, some of the prevention, I hear that um, cognitive, act cognitive activities such as learning a second language, or how to play a musical instrument are promoted as therapies to delay the cognitive effects. Um, is there any evidence that these cognitive interventions or activities could affect the physical progress of disease? And would you expect, expect such effects? We've 
And everything projected, including Todd, I'd love you to comment on this, including the idea that if you used your brain like that, you could accelerate the disease because you'd be wearing out your neurons. Uh, we seem to have proven that that doesn't happen uh, because the other thing I didn't mention about staying in school or going back to school is that one of the other big things that we see when we look retrospectively at who got the disease and who did not and what kinds of healthcare, what kinds of activities and so forth did they do uh, one of the most powerful was level of education. Level of education gives you this resilience or resistance or what we call cognitive reserve. And it is almost surely the reason why some people who might otherwise have progressed to get the disease don't get it and they die of something else before the disease can wear its way through. So yes, uh, playing an instrument, frustrating, but really good thing to do if you're in the uh, decades beyond say 50. Uh, uh, learning a second language, also a terrific idea, also makes you feel great when you master it. Uh, those are all things that do help. So cognitive activity, which I should have mentioned with exercise, uh, and education, taking courses and so forth. Many universities offer them free uh, to people who are above 60 or 65. Uh, you can check with the local universities. They are all good at trying to fight off the disease. Yeah, I, I would just add to that that there's some studies which are not what I call sometimes, I like to say there's things that are settled science and then there's things that aren't. And one of the ones that's not completely settled, but I think fits our conceptualization of the disease is that people with higher levels of educational attainment typically could withstand the uh, pathologies underlying Alzheimer's disease without them being apparent for a longer period of time. But then sometimes they actually fall off a cliff a little faster. There's some data out there. I'm not sure if I totally endorse that. But it, it does say that using your, you know, we go back to when we graduated from medical school and we take the Hippocratic Oath, the physician do no harm. You know, learning a new language, exercising your brain can do no harm. Um, taking a medication can. So, there, you know, right now where we're, we're at, we'd love to have things that were game, true game changers where everybody looked at, you took this antibody or this new treatment and you're not gonna get Alzheimer's disease. We'd love to be able to say we have that, we don't. Yeah. But we don't have that for many diseases, even though we've made progress. So, so related to that, we want, someone would ask about, is a hyperbaric chamber useful? I know of no evidence for that. No, no, there's, there's no evidence. In some ways you could hypothesize uh, that it would do more harm uh, because with an excess of oxygen molecules come what are called oxygen radicules are kind of unattached and they should be. And those kinds of things can do damage to um, tissues in the case of someone with degenerative disease. But in general, it's been tried in small uh, uh, trials, small numbers of people in trials. And it, there isn't a really good reason to think that it should work. Okay, related to that, how about B12, turmeric, um, or curcumin? Curcumin, yeah. Curcumin, sorry. I mean, uh, uh, so of, of the sort of nutraceuticals or natural products, I mean, there's, uh, I, I think the data is mixed with respect to Alzheimer's disease. Um, but curcumin does have other health, cardiovascular health benefits. And again, the likelihood that you could do harm to yourself by eating a lot of curcumin is very small, um, if, if, if existent at all. So um, there are some studies in it that link it to actually being able to possibly modify slightly the underlying pathologies. Um, but I would, I would suggest that, you know, there, there's pretty good studies showing that turmeric and curcumin have cardiovascular benefit. And therefore, if somebody wants to try that, that's really up, up to them. And, uh, you know, that, that there's, uh, again, it, it's one of the few where you might say that there's, there's little harm, it's not expensive, you know, and, it, and, it, and as I said, one can pull up a, a a plethora of, you know, uh, data that ranges from epidemiology to some experimental modeling studies that would slightly support this, but I wouldn't say it's a, a slam dunk by any sense. So, so. No, I, I agree with that. I think also there is a difference between <clears throat> taking uh, some of these supplements as a preventive and having the, uh, the hope that it will either cure your uh, disease or um, 
make it go on slowly. There are no medications that are demonstrated to be helpful to your memory. And that includes a lot of the uh, complementary or alternative medications that you see advertised on television. Uh, vitamin B12, especially in the United States, is not uh, something that is uh, uh, in a deficit state in the majority of people. It is true that in normal people, as your B12 serum levels of B12 are lower, you see that people perform not quite as well on cognitive tests. But the kind of dementia that you get, the kind of thinking problem you get with um, a B12 deficiency is a very different thing than Alzheimer's disease. It involves hallucinations and problems with feeling uh, in your feet and so forth. And, uh, the, and, and an, a, of course, a, a, uh, an anemia. Uh, so, uh, because B12 is necessary for your red cells. So I wouldn't put a lot of um, stock in some of these advertisements for these things. Curcumin, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, has some antioxidant effects, <clears throat> which have been shown to be helpful in heart. Uh, but as I uh, said before, you could probably get it from this, every single cardiovascular risk is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. And 75% of the people who are autopsy with Alzheimer's disease have some degree of vascular change in their brains that almost surely is helping them develop the disease. So it's one of the reasons why these emphases on exercise, hypertension control and so forth are all there. But anything that helps doesn't hurt, isn't too expensive and doesn't interfere with your other medications. If somebody wants to take it, we don't object to that. Okay. But I hope you need to talk to your doctor. <laughs> we only have time for a few more questions. I'm going to kind of summarize a couple together. So could you give us a really brief description of what's normal aging, maybe what is dementia and what's Alzheimer's? Well, um, dementia, I'll start with what dementia is, you know, an impairment of cognitive function. So, and, and Alzheimer's is in the age population is the biggest component of that, at least as we define it. So roughly, if you have a progressive loss of cognitive functions and memory declines, you know, the odds are to 60 to 70% of the time, it's probably Alzheimer's disease. Um, the next big chunk is vascular dementia, so a small number of strokes or, or other vascular changes, which are ill-defined. And then there are a whole bunch of diseases that have very difficult names to pronounce, like frontal temporal dementia with Parkinsonism linked to chromosome 17, that, that you know, are, account for some other things. But they're usually, the clinical symptoms are often different. Um, as one ages, there is some slowing and processing speed, but there's not, not these cognitive changes. So the no notion is you could be, you could age into your 90s and have normal cognition, maybe a little slowing in your processing speed. Um, and then Alzheimer's disease characteristically has this pattern of initial memory problems, progressing to executive functions and ability to navigate. But there are variants of Alzheimer's disease where they get mistaken for other things because the presentation's a little unusual. And usually what we find out is that, well, the pathology is just a little more prevalent in other areas of the brain when we finally sort of look at it. And so it really was Alzheimer's disease that looked a little different just because the pathology occurred in an area of the brain that, for example, sparing memory, sometimes you get Alzheimer's disease that there's the hippocampus that most people have heard of. That's the, like this, the, the seat of you need that for your short-term memory. And when that's typically severely affected in Alzheimer's disease, but sometimes it's not. So again, there, but you still have plaques and tangles. So we, you know, that's why the, that pathological definition is so, so important. And, and so, you know, I think the, the important thing for people to remember is it's not inevitable to lose your cognitive health as you age, if we, especially if we could get rid of the pathologies in vascular disease. Okay, um, last question, and uh, then we'll have to wrap it up from there. Could you address um, how someone could maybe get on a registry or, or look into some of the clinical trials that are happening at UF now or that may be happening down the road? Right. Well, <clears throat> uh, Todd, you want to go first? You can go. Steve. Right. So <clears throat> there are a number of studies being done here. Todd mentioned one of them, this uh, uh, gentle uh, stimulation 
either with magnetic uh, stimulation or uh, electrical stimulation, just the equivalent of a nine month, a nine volt battery, nothing major, looking to see about the effects on improving memory in either normal aging or in people with mild cognitive impairment. Um, periodically letters will come to, the cards will come to people telling them that there is a study, would they be interested? We actually get them, my wife and I, because we are of a certain age. But um, the Institute on Aging uh, has a, at UF, has a registry that they keep of people. And uh, if you contact the MBI office, we can put you in touch if you're, if you're near UF, we'll put you in touch with people who can sign you up for one of these registries. Uh, many of our researchers are, especially those looking at, at neuropsychological testing and at MR, are very interested in normal people. Normal people are, you know, people come to hospitals and, and clinics because they feel things aren't normal. Normal people don't automatically come. We need people who will volunteer to do this sort of thing. So if you contact the office, we will get you to somebody who can get you on a list. Okay, I can probably send that information out in the follow-up um, email Great. where I send a copy of the recording. Okay. Anything else you guys want to add? Just that we thank everybody for their attention. And, and again, I, I would, you know, I just reiterate the importance of advocacy. I think that over our course of research here, we've seen this field grow and change and the, the analogy to other diseases where we've had more success, you know, they, you know, they talk about a war on cancer, you know, but we still don't, haven't cured all forms of cancer, and many, especially treatment resistant cancers, it's, it's battles and they occur over many years and they take a long time, but we need advocacy to continue to support these efforts and we need to, you know, we also need people when they're able to, to participate in our studies so that we could advance this. And, and finally, I think that I'm cautiously optimistic, just to, to leave on an up note, that I really truly believe that over the next you know, decade, we're gonna, we're gonna have learned from the challenges that we faced and sort of, in, in, in some ways, naivete of, or, you know, it was what we knew then and we thought this stuff was going to work. You know, we figured out amyloid, we figured out how to tackle it. We're just going to translate that into a therapy and Alzheimer's disease is going to go away. Um, We've gotten much more humble since yeah, that time. <laughs> so I think all of us have, everybody, whether it's at somebody in a pharmaceutical company or here, you know, we've all been humbled by this, but what we, what they, there's a, a, a a tremendous amount of teamwork, not just at UF, but across the international community. We're working together as teams. It's, taking, it's going to take, you know, an international village to take this on, not just a single. Right. All right. Well, I thank everyone for joining us today and I appreciate your time. I'm sorry we weren't able to get to every question. I will see if I can um, find out a few of the answers that are still lingering around there and get those that information out to you. So thank you guys so much for your time. I appreciate you guys for joining us. Thank you. It's our pleasure. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.